Welcome to another episode of Barstool Perspective, where a couple of imbeciles give you the booze news of the week. I'm Mike Morgan, and you, sir, are... Who are these imbeciles? <laughs> <laughs> Relatively bright people. But the thing of it is, we're drinking coffee today because we just got our new industrial coffee maker hooked up. And, you know, we've been building this bar. I plumbed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I ran all the plumbing. I mean, I have advanced degrees. You run uh, an industrial brewery. Yep, I and did the plumbing there. it only took us an hour and 15 minutes to figure out how to make a pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> After the two weeks it took to build it all and get it ready. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, cheers. <laughs> what happened this week? In the alcohol world, Brett? Well, it was a fairly busy week. Uh, there was a new study that came out that shows that RTDs are an impulse decision. 60% of purchases are planned for ready-to-drink cocktails versus beer, wine, and spirits where 80% of the purchases are planned. So 4 in 10 people that go into the store to buy alcohol will see RTDs, didn't realize they existed before, and then end up buying them. So. That really just shows that RTDs are a new market and most people still don't know about them. Even though the industry as a whole is saying RTDs are the next big thing and they're going to be everywhere and they're growing like crazy. Why? I just think it's because people don't know about them yet. In this country, we've never had gin and tonic in a can that you can just buy at the store, but now it's becoming more widely available. Why are they a growing market? I mean, why do people like it? The, the ones that I've had are not good. No, no, they largely aren't there yet on a quality perspective, yeah. but people like convenience, people like easy, and that's what RTDs sure. are. Instead of having to go to the liquor store, at least in Ohio, you can just go to the grocery store, pick up your gin and tonic, not have to make a separate trip, which a lot of grocery stores now have liquor stores in them and yada yada, but I think it's largely just purely convenience. When I was a freshman in college, I used to like pour out half the can of Coke and then fill it up with bourbon. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe I invented them. <laughs> uh, I don't know who we can reach out to about getting your my, proper my, uh, yeah, payments. Yeah, patent but or whatever. It sounds like someone owes you money, and I don't know who. I think so. I think a lot of people owe me money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a whole it's separate just, issue. <laughs> I just uh, don't seem to have viable legal claims for it. I mean, RTDs, they're most currently enjoyed at home. Yeah. while watching TV with a significant other in the suburbs by a woman. That is the prototypical yeah. RTD drinker currently in the U.S. It's a, suburb a suburbanite woman who likes hanging out with her partner, who likes sitting yeah. at their ass, at their house, watching television. Who's too goddamn lazy to, while sitting at the house, mix two things in a glass? Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, I could see, uh, okay, you know, I'm... Uh, Moving around somewhere, or whatever. I'm taking a rafting trip, and I want to drink some G and T's while I'm doing it. But if you're sitting at home watching TV, you're too lazy to mix a drink. Well, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I, suburbanites. <laughs> oh, I you know who you are. I don't disagree with the suburbanites thing, but I, I think that the the key takeaway here is that these things are available at grocery stores that give an opportunity for the impulse buy. Yeah. So you can save a trip. And I think that's right. why you end up having them. Not necessarily because they're lazy, but, well, I mean... I'm going to stick with the lazy. <laughs> uh, people are ready to party. I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next this story. Next story. <laughs> uh, people are ready to party, and we thought in the industry it was going to be last year, that people... COVID was up, we all decided it didn't exist anymore last year, and we were going to go out and live like it was 1999 yeah. again. Right? Didn't happen last year. People had COVID hesitancy. People were afraid to go out mm -hmm. to the bars. Inflation was hitting. All, I, went all the bars. I went to the bars <laughs> well, like they were going out of business, man. Well, which they were. <laughs> so and they are. still are. Yeah. But people are finally ready to party this year, and we saw double-digit right. growth year over year on both Cinco de Mayo weekends and Mother Day, Mother's Day weekends. So people are ready to go back out. I didn't They're know ready Mother's for Day weekend weekends. was like a big get hammered kind of uh, weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mom, let's get fucked up. I haven't, been, I haven't gotten my mom drunk for Mother's Day once. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> I think it's more brunch, but yeah, you're getting right. fucked up at night with yeah. your mom. Fine, whatever. Yeah. 
Uh, I always liked Mother's Day weekend at college, but it was... Well, you know, that was a different thing at OU. I, I mean, sure. my mom didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you weren't interested in your mother being there anyway. No. It's other people's mothers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim. God, I wish Cougar had been a thing back then. <laughs> Jim. Well, Cougars, it's I guess. It's not just for like... kids anymore. <laughs> gin, the original bottle drink. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of new flavors of gin. You know how in 15 yeah. years ago there was a lot of different flavors of vodka? Yeah. We had the cake vodka and yes. the party vodkas oh, and the sprinkle vodkas and whatever yeah. else. Well, Almost all really disgusting. Very well, sugary and yeah. Crap. It was crap. Mm, well, that is happening to gin now. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have coffee gin. We have gin designed for shooters. We have flavor extension gins. We have no alcohol gin. It's a gin boom. No alcohol gin? A gin Yeah. How, why? <laughs> well, when you want to drink pine needles, but don't get fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that sounds like a fantastic idea. It isn't my idea of good time, but I guess if you're pregnant or just looking to cut back, you know, sure. if you're trying to wean yourself off of alcohol because of alcoholism or whatever serious uh, condition, not good for you. Or you just want to cut back on your drinking. Yeah. Why would you play around with something that just constantly reminds you that you're not getting drunk? Uh, Do they have yeah. like fake crack for crack smokers? Like I'm trying to wean myself off heroin, so here's some fake heroin. Which I guess they do have that actually methadone. But you know, I mean, I, uh, there is a there's definitely a component to drinking that is just about the function of it and the mechanics of it. Like I remember reading some exactly. I remember reading some interview of Alice Cooper a long time ago, and Alice Cooper was an alcoholic and he quit drinking, and he was talking about how much water he drinks just because of mm. the action of always drinking something, you know, the physical thing. I mean, I sat here compulsively drinking a really terrible cup of coffee <laughs> <laughs> because it is just something that I do, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, you know, I, I guess I can kind of see it, but okay. correct. Yeah, that, it makes sense. It makes sense. And I, it depends on the individual. You know, if you have... Uh, if you have real problems, I think sometimes it can be a trigger for, if you're just trying to cut back a little bit, I guess I can see it. Uh, My approach is to get really stoned, but um, I don't know that I recommend that uh, from a medical standpoint, but... Which country do you think drinks the most gin in the world? England? No. United States? Nope. Russia? Nope. That'd be vodka. The Philippines. What? The Philippines drinks 30% of the world's gin. Good God! <laughs> yeah. It's uh, not even a big country. No. Uh, I mean, I guess there's a lot of people there. What's the... Well, I'm not going to further embarrass myself. Anyway, the Philippines, they drink 31.4% of the world's gin, which who would have guessed? Wow! The rest of the world is only 24%. U.S. is in third place at 11.7%, and then the U.K. We so. haven't drank a lot of gin here since prohibition when we started to get vodka and I don't are you a gin drinker at all I love gin I used to think that I hated it but my neighbor turned me on to gin and what I realized is that I just hated really bad gin yep. because yep. when I was younger that's all I drank you know really bad mm -hmm. cheap gin but a scotch nice gin the, the complexity way. of it uh, yeah yeah good scotch is delicious yeah but cheap scotch not so much I like drinking a glass of pine needles. Just yeah, give me the sure. piniest goddamn gin that yeah. you can. I love that. Yeah, I like it in gin. I don't really like it in beer. That incredibly piney. You know, no. A little bit of it. A little bit of it There's in the IPA that can work. Yeah, but too much of it I don't like. Sunny D Vodka Seltzer. It tastes like not Sunny D and not good seltzer. It just tastes like nothing. I just threw up a little bit in my mouth. That's <laughs> just stop. Would everybody just stop? This, uh, I, the reason I bring this up is because there was a whole article, a whole ass article written about Sunny D vodka seltzer not tasting good and not tasting yeah. like Sunny D. But to me, it highlights the bigger trend that's happening in alcohol right now that is specific nostalgia based marketing targeted directly at millennials. And we just. Okay. And millennials just. Eat it, hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. We just fall into this trap of like, oh shit, I remember Sunny D from the 90s. Well, guess what? Sunny D sucked then and it sucks now. It doesn't matter if yeah. you put vodka in it. 
it's still terrible. It's not just your generation. I mean, nostalgia always works. With Gen X, mm. every movie that's been made for the past 15 years has all been a remake of uh, a movie that was around when I was young so that my generation takes their kids to, you know, the remake of a movie that sucked in the 80s. But um, Flavor itself, Super I mean... Super Mario Brothers was great. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it Nostalgia is a lot of people's favorite flavor. I mean, yes. you really yes. see that here in the city of Cincinnati. People outside of the city of Cincinnati, if you come to town, it's actually a very nice city and there's a lot going on. If you come to town, some idiot's going to say, oh, you have to try the chili. No, you do not, because it's not good. It's oh, terrible. Man. It's not chili, and it's disgusting. But We just people alienated are, the entirety of Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, it, because Cincinnatians will go to war over, uh, it's a really good hot dog sauce, but it's not chili. And mm. Cincinnatians, it's a bolognese. They, they grow up on it, though, and they love it. It's Taco so, Bell quality meat in a shitty sauce with yeah. a buttload of crappy cheddar cheese on top. Right. With usually overcooked noodles. Yes. There's yeah. nothing redeeming about it other no. than it's co purely comfort food. No. No. And, and, it, and it does mean... eat the shit it, out of it. And it I does mean more here. <laughs> the cheese conies I like because it's a great hot dog sauce. Uh, Appalachian Mountain Brewing bought back their brewery from Anheuser-Busch. Wow, where are they? They are in the Appalachian Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> They're aptly named. I then. think they are in Virginia. Okay. Uh, the Anheuser Busch bought them about five years ago or so, and like when Anheuser Busch bought up them and Platform and Devil's Backbone and a couple other craft breweries that they bastardized and ruined the sales of, they also did that to Appalachian Mountain, and they're probably looking to get rid of it. The brewery owners now having made bank off of selling it, selling it can buy it back at a discount and are probably wow. richer for it and now have complete control of their brewery again to resell it again, I'm sure, in the future. Very cool. Well, good to you guys at Appalachian Mountain Brewing, wherever you are. Uh, there are new American viticulture areas that have been proposed for wine in the U.S. Okay. And that is a specific geographic area of origin that is marketable and protected. So you can't say you have a Napa cab if you ferment and grow Cabernet grapes in Ohio. You have to say that yeah. you just have Cabernet wine. But so these, these viticulture areas, they carry with them a lot of weight with marketing mm -hmm. and you sometimes get some tax breaks with the government and state municipalities and whatnot. What are the areas? Most of them are actually not in California. There's a mm. couple areas in Ohio, there's areas across the uh, Appalachian Mountains, and there's an area over in towards the middle of the country in the Missouri region. Great, so now seven all those areas. areas have to do is actually make drinkable wine. <laughs> 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 there is a, uh, there's a grape that was made at Cornell, a hybrid, that is a Pinot Noir grape that grows really well in Kentucky, and it actually makes a nice wine. There's one good winery in the state of Kentucky, and they're using this grape, and it's it's a nice bottle. The what a lot of wineries in the Midwest fall prey to is that you can cover up your lack of skill with sugar. Right, and that's what 99% of them do. So by being bad at making wine and relying on sugar, mm -hmm. you have this negative feedback loop that has been created now, where customers come into a winery in the Midwest. And they expect basically bottles of alcoholic syrup. Yeah. Even if you make a great bottle, like the you know, Finger Lakes region makes great bottles and they're not too far from Ohio. We can make good bottles of wine near Lake Erie in Ohio, but everyone People expects sugary wine. shit. Yeah. And it just is it just is this sugar, fuck it. There's a uh, an area about an hour south of Cincinnati in Kentucky where there are these three wineries clustered. And one of them is the one that uses that Kentucky version of a, of a Pinot grape. And they actually make very solid wines, mm -hmm. but they're, everything they make is a real wine for grown-ups. And when you go by those three wineries, they're the one that you can always find a table at. You know, they, the other two are just killing business yeah. because all they make are sugary, you know, strawberry, pineapple wine, whatever, all nonsense for, you know, children's drinks. And the one like grown-up winery is 
struggling because they make really good wine. Well, speaking of children's drinks, Ted Cruz mm -hmm. has just recently launched an investigation into the Anheuser-Busch uh, backlash around the Dylan Mulvaney. Yes. Um, Thank God. Marketing. Somebody needed to get to the bottom of this. Well, his reason isn't what his real reason is. Yeah. What the real reason is, is transphobia, clearly. Right. And dog whistling behavior and just yes. basically shaking people down, mm -hmm. creating a culture of fear. But what he claims the reason is, is that because Dylan Mulvaney has so many users on TikTok and kids use TikTok, by them partnering with Dylan Mulvaney, they're advertising to children and that's a problem. Good God. On season 1.5 of Bruce Guy's Happy Hour podcast, the podcast that we do that goes through the history of craft beer, season 1.5, we actually decided to go back in time to explain why beer sucked before the craft beer movement started and some of the things that went on with mass brewed beer. So in one of those episodes, we talk a lot about Spuds McKenzie mm -hmm. and the fact that the whole Spuds McKenzie campaign, it really not only revived, I mean, it kind of made Bud Light Bud Light. And it did it by really marketing to kids to teenagers, and it, that was my generation. I mean, it was marketing to me when I was a teenager. And nobody cared about that, but um, now Ted Cruz needs to get to the bottom of what? Uh, yeah, it, it, that's even a twisted. Thanks for really tackling the important things, Ted Cruz. I mean, the border's under control. Healthcare system works fantastically. So, uh, yeah, There's thanks. There's no mass shootings in Texas or anything There's no either. mass shootings in your state. Yeah, everything is running perfectly. So, thanks and, for getting on that one. And look, I love craft beer. We both do. But, like, there's so much fucking cartoon horse shit that's mm -hmm. being marketed in craft beer. You can't yes. tell me that that is more marketed to kids than what's happening in craft beer. And speaking of dumb... Everybody knows the kids are really um, transgender spokespeople. It's what, it's what all kids love. It's not cartoon bears or whatever, or dogs in suits. Well, if it yeah. wasn't for the grace of God and the Church of Christ keeping these kids in line, we'd all yes. be transgender. Yes, absolutely. Well, you go, Ted. <laughs> speaking of bullshit advertising beer names... Here's one for you that I knew you would just love. It's called Taco Tuesday Spicy Pineapple Margarita High ABV Hard Kombucha. <laughs> you just want to fill me full of hate today. I mean, you're just trying to set me off, man. God. Uh, I don't have anything else on that one. Uh, Good. <laughs> uh, NIL beers are coming out. NIL is name, image, likeness. This is how you basically legally can pay college kids now to play sports at your right. college. And there's NIL beers that are coming, where portions of these beers are getting kicked back to the NIL to pay for students. Because um, they can't actually sponsor the brewery and be a spokesperson for the brewery, but the brewery can be a spokesperson for the NIL as a whole and kick money back to the college in turn, in re and then get placement out of it and advertising, yada, yada, yada. So locally, University of Cincinnati just signed a deal with Rheingeist. There's Exile Brewing just announced one with uh, Iowa University. So it's happening across the country. Two just announced this week. I have a feeling we are going to see maybe a dozen to two dozen more by the end of the summer before football season starts. So what does that look like? Like a uh, college athlete's name goes on the beer or, or what? You could, you could put it. What both of these have done is just put the name of the school on the can and yeah. the name of the uh, NIL collective that collects the money. And then for every case sold, they're kicking back a portion, like 20% or so. So just more greasy stuff. Yeah, that uh, is greasy. Speaking of greasy, Justin's House of Bourbon in Kentucky has been fined for keeping bad books. Now, what's the okay. big deal with that? The big deal is that really what's probably happening is that they were buying bourbon illegally and then reselling it, and they were mm. cooking their books so it didn't look like they were illegally buying bourbon. Uh, How would they be buying it illegally? Through the gray market or black market, so a reseller. Somebody else went to a different state, picked up some product okay. that's rare, so it's sold cross, it to them. So it's cross-state, probably. Potentially. Potentially, or there's not sales tax happening, or some some the government wasn't getting their money somehow. Yeah, and they were reselling. Just sounds like tax fraud. 
Allegedly. I mean, yes. I don't know those people, but... All I know is that they were fine for bad books, and I can only assume it's because bourbon is insane right now, and the resale market yes. around bourbon is just out of control. If you're spending more than $50 on a bottle of bourbon, you're getting negative returns. It doesn't taste better than a $35 bottle of Buffalo Trace. There's just no way. Well... Not that much better. There are a lot of people out there that are really over the moon with bourbon now. I mean, you can't go to a bar in Kentucky that has less than 30 bottles of bourbon in it now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if bourbon's your thing, cool. But yeah, I don't understand paying $400 for a bottle of bourbon. Yeah, if you if you ever wonder, am I spending too much on bourbon? If you've ever even thought that, the answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes is the answer. Remember how crazy Beanie Babies <laughs> were in the 90s? Yeah. Don't be an yeah. adult Beanie Baby hoarder. That's, right. what that's what bourbon is right now. Yeah. So speaking of craziness, the non-alcoholic story of the week is Ron DeSantis is burning his state to the ground. Disney has announced yeah. that they are canceling their plans to build a $1 billion office. They're moving over 150 jobs out of the state. And immigrants are leaving, and Florida's basically in shambles. Yeah. Um, Ron DeSantis is, I think, dead in the water as a presidential candidate. Yeah. I mean, the guy uh, picked such a stupid fight with Disney. And it. Everyone loves Disney. Why would you fight yeah. Disney? That's the dumbest thing to fight. I don't like Disney, but I'm rooting for Disney in this scenario because. They're just, A, because DeSantis is crazy, and B, they're going to win. Yeah. Um, this First Amendment lawsuit that they have mm -hmm. is a really strong lawsuit, and DeSantis just keeps digging his hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And on the lawsuit front, I heard DeSantis's response to the fact that Disney pulled out of this $1 billion deal and cost the state a bunch of jobs. Mm -hmm was that, well, uh, Disney's doing terrible business, so it's reasonable that they would cancel you know, a bad business decision uh, to save themselves money. And it's obviously him trying to save face, but frankly, it sounds to me like he probably just slandered Disney. So dig your hole a little bit deeper, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sums up DeSantis. Meet, meatball Ron? Is yeah. that right? Meatball Run. That sums yeah. up Meatball Run. So our email question of the week, which if you have any questions, please email us at info at bruceguys.com or bruceguys.beer, excuse me, or hit us up on social media or just reach out however you can. Uh, the email question of the week is, are seltzers still taking over the world? Were they ever? At the I, time, it seemed that way. I think that seltzers, I don't think seltzers were ever taking over the world, but as we've discussed, I think that seltzers are going to take a consistent percentage out of light beer sales. I thought seltzers were going to come and disappear. I now believe that they're going to hang around, at least for the foreseeable future, and that they are going to cut into light beer sales, yep. at least until they're replaced with the next whatever next seltzer. flavorless thing correct there's always less flavor on the horizon right there's one thing we have proven as a humanity is we do not like how things taste except for sugar right on that note make sure to check out the bruce guys happy hour podcast where we explore the history of craft beer hit us up on youtube like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts wherever you watch your youtubes uh give us some ratings five stars whatever you got to do just interact with us that keeps us going that makes us keep making more content, and hopefully you're getting some enjoyment out of this, because I know that I am. Now, 2023 is the year to party, so cheers to you people, and we're going to drink something that tastes good now. <laughs>